those basics of foundations and then the transformation as well that can often be the thing that leapfrogs you against your competitor or gives you the market share goal that you want or just gives you some kind of sexy PR. But I think you've got to do both. I'm happy to tell you about one of the industry's best kept secrets, an event designed for global brand owners by global brand owners. It's the WFA's Global Marketer Week, the event for international marketers. Every year it's hosted in a different market and in May it sees the event return to Toronto, boasting one of the most senior lineups of clients on stage as well as in the audience. Listen to global CMOs from InBev, IBM, Nissan, PepsiCo and MasterCard and meet with delegates from 150 brand owners in the WFA's membership. We have an offer specifically for you, a discounted fee for listeners to the shiny new object podcast so go to gmctoronto2024.com that's gmctoronto2024.com and use the discount code wfa24 a-u-t-o-c-r-e-a i'll read that again that's wfa24 a-u-t-o-c-r-e-a and that will get you a lovely discount all right see you there Hello and welcome to the Shiny New Object Podcast. My name is Tom Ollerton. I'm the founder of the automated creative creative effectiveness ad tech platform. And this is a podcast about the future of data-driven marketing. I have the absolute pleasure and privilege of interviewing some of our industry's leaders about the future of this space. I am in Diageo's fancy Halcyon bar at the top of their HQ. So thank you to those guys for letting me have this ginormous bar all to myself for the afternoon as I watch the sunset. But what is more exciting than that is the fact I'm on a call with Christina Rapsamanikis, who is Global VP Digital and E-Commerce at Mars pet nutrition. So Christina, for anyone who doesn't know who you are and what you do, could you give us a bit of an introduction? Yeah. Hi, Tom. Great to be with you. Um, I'm ultimately a digital growth leader that's worked across various CPG and luxury businesses, including Unilever, Nespresso, Coty, um, and then my own D2C fashion business. And today, as you say, I'm leading global digital e-commerce for Mars Pet Nutrition. I have to ask you about your DTC fashion business. Tell me, all, <laughs> tell me all about that. Yeah, it was an amazing concept. It still would be an amazing concept, I believe. Um, in 2015, launched it um, with a great mission. It was called Formula. It was all about making clothes work harder for women. Um, unknown, fa- unknown fact, maybe, I was the first person to bring in Vija sneakers to the UK. Um, had the foresight that they were going to be great. So as my brother says, you would have been really rich had you kept that business open. So yeah, amazing learnings. Amazing. I have no idea what those trainers are, being the world's least fashionable man, but it sounds very impressive (laughs) nonetheless. So I can imagine the unbelievable amount of experience and intelligence and strength you must have got from having that experience of setting up that business. Do you also take practical experience and marry it with reading? Are you like a marketing reading book? And if so, is is there a title that you recommend? Yeah, I think you have to be an avid learner. Um, Yeah, definitely a marketing book I would recommend. Um, And that would be Rebel Ideas um, by Matthew. Hopefully I can say his last name correctly. Saeed? Um, or Syed. Um, and, and it kind of came across my path as a recommendation via a great friend. And like me, she was in the middle of an inflection point in a transformational role. And the book's all about diverse thinking. Um, and at that moment, I was in the beauty industry leading a digital transformation in a local role. So how did the diverse thinking in the book help you at, at that inflection point? Yeah, I think firstly, it was about my team and I learned all about the power of psychological safety via this book and giving people space and encouragement to build, um, firstly. And then secondly, that virtual and horizontal team piece when you're trying to put something into a business and ultimately your stakeholders. And it talks a lot about thinking about them in a game of chess, um, which sounds a little bit competitive, but I think what it was trying to explain was in a provocative way, really try and get inside the opponent's head and the, those stakeholders, like what's important to them to make things stick. And then lastly, the consumer, um, which is really apt for beauty, which was increasing frequency. Um, they introduced this concept called, I don't know if you've heard of this, link chaining. So link chaining journeys. So in beauty, it was really important that we were looking at the journey of the consumer all the time. 
um, grocery shopping via going to work. Um, so that was a really big one for us. Like, how do we improve our frequency? And then the last one, which I loved and still use today, is that idea of cross-pollinating ideas, um, coming up with two concepts and building on ideas and sharing concepts and, again, allowing for that space for people to actually think and come up with ideas. So it was a really good book that I still go back to today. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a really big fan of his bounce with the table tennis book, which sounds really unappealing, but... I love the way that he sort of deconstructs the idea of talent and the fact that it doesn't exist and it's this kind of situation in, in nature. There's more nurture than it is nature. I thought it was interesting. And then black black box thinking. It's just I, 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 do you read that one? No. Whoa, the top line on that one was it, it opens with the story of this this lady dying in a routine operation, and then the 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 surgeon comes out and explains to the husband, "Look, you know, I'm really sorry that it was it was just one of those things. It was just an accident, didn't happen." But he was a he worked in aviation where uh, the aviation industry kind of shares their every time there's a crash or something they share the black box with everyone so everyone has all of the data on everything from technic technical and audio so that every flight or every time anything happens every flight kind of improves on every other flight so that's why you're flying so safe and then he got that message from that surgeon and said well i want to see the black box and they're like oh no it's one of those things and so he's actually brought in much more of a black box approach to to the healthcare industry and, and saved like probably millions of lives and it's it's just an unbelievable story and bit of writing from him so i haven't read this book that's all the recommendation i need so thanks for showing yeah, up but, um, let's let's trade those recommendations then yeah i'd like to talk about psychological safety on a data-driven marketing podcast so like i get it and it's kind of one of those things that looks great on a slide and it's easy to say but how do you make it happen yeah i think it i think bringing i think you have to put these levels and, and when you're leading groups to put an establishment of data structure in i think we that's our job to do that and once we put that into place then you can say to the teams all yours now we've given you the authority to go and get curious like join at the gingerbread trails and i think it's amazing when you have a group of people um, and hopefully as diverse as possible um and they're able to kind of use what's human nature. They all want to build. They want to feel part of something and allowing people the space to play and explore. I think it's really important. And then tell me about link chaining journeys. That, embarrassingly, that's a new one to me. So tell me, help me understand that, that better. Yeah. So I think it goes back to that like consumer of understanding where the consumer is shopping, how they're shopping, um, using signals. And we learned that a lot in beauty, you know, network. <laughs> you know this when you have a brand you can get quite egotistical of that's not my brand that's not that that, that doesn't belong in grocery then you start to look at this data and you're like oh yeah they go that luxury consumer does go to the grocery store just like all of us so how can we kind of interrupt them on their way how can we get them um seeing our signals online or like just being there in store um so that was a really big one for us So can we get to a specific bit of advice for data-driven marketing? Is there one silver bullet that you find yourself sharing with your teams most often or something you've just always works and you always go back to it? Yeah, I think I think it goes back to that allowing people to build and giving a framework. And one of the frameworks I found that's really helpful for me um, is something I call the five, five A's. So like being aspirational about what are we trying to do with this data? Um, so aspiring to a, to a bigger vision. How do we assess it all? How do we build it? How do we act upon it? Which is a big underline for me, having such bias for action, a big so what. And then how do we advance it? Um, and the team seem to respond really well to that. Um, and it kind of helps you when you're doing some cross-functional work as well. That everybody's got something to sing to. So I've missed an A. Aspirational, access it, assess. act upon it. and uh, Architect. Architect. Be the architect behind it, act and then advance. And it really works. So can you just give me a kind of Billy Basics run through of that? You can, you can use a fictional example or a real one. So you're you know, you're gonna, you're gonna launch a campaign for whatever cosmetics brand. How would you how would you run through those five A's? Yeah, I can give you a live one actually. Doing a piece of work at the moment, um, where our poor e com teams have like an incredible amount of data, but um it's all living in many i won't give you an actual number many different tools as probably is happening for most people um so we've done a piece of work on how do we consolidate those tools and we've done 
the work to look at like what are we trying to get to like aspiring wise how many tools do we want to drive efficiency how do we assess what the hell is in those tools and um what's the data going into it and then how do we archetype how to archetype them um with our DT, dt and da teams and then what are we going to do like that act piece which i think is quite a big behavioral shift for us of how do we move from data to insight to data for actions and and then how do we advance it like what's the 2.0 of it um Lovely. So now we're going to move on to your shiny new object, which is practice of foundation and transformation. So I know what all those words mean together, but <laughs> what, what what is that and why is it your shiny new object? Well, um, yeah, very much a practice and it's uh, tried and tested and it's both, as you say, foundation and, and there's a big underline on the and transformation. Um, and I think the magic happens for everybody when you deliver both. Um, and that means foundation is a lasered approach to all those tasks that everybody are just like, oh God, I don't want to do it. I used to call them brilliantly boring basics at Coty. Tried to do it in Mars and they hated it. But it is those basics of foundations and then the transformation as well um, that can often be the thing that leapfrogs you against your competitor or gives you the market share goal that you want or just gives you some kind of sexy PR. But I think you've got to do both. So can you take me through the brilliant, boring basics or not sure what that got translated to at Mars, but why are they boring? Why are they important? And how do you do them better? Yeah, they're often like the like weed. It's often the weed work of looking at, if you think about the e-com world, like what's going on with that perfect store? What's going on with the ratings and reviews? Why are they down? What's it telling us? Um, even things like supply chain, which is so important for e-com, people forget. But like what markets have got EDI and how do we send our orders and which don't? And back to that data piece, like how do we want to build this? And often people can think in the world that we work in, it's really cool. And we all get to sit in a Diageo building. <laughs> and, it, and it really is that, like it's those frameworks, and sorry, not even frameworks, the basics of the foundations that you have to just continually look at and continually improve um and i feel really passionate about them because they're the real big needle movers yeah so i, I think that there's a, a sort of common misconception in marketing where some marketing people talk about like they run the whole business but my view that marketing is there to to act as a tool to solve a business problem and too often when marketing acts in its own little bubble so oh we got the you know we got the we got the brand house and we delivered all the different formats to all the different platforms but ultimately if, if there's a listing issue or as you say a supply chain issue then the whole thing falls over and it might actually not be a marketing problem it might be something the shape of the box or the tin might be wrong or something like that so how do you use data to make sure that you're tackling the right basics i'm kind of curious to know what kind of intelligence you have to find out where the gap in the chain is yeah um i think it comes from you're going to want to use your consumer data for one that kind of drives everything and done that a few times now at Coty, i called it like voice of the beauty consumer and now i'm calling it voice of the pet parents that kind of shapes everything and unites teams so you can look at that full end-to-end -end. so you can include supply chain in guys this is falling down and we've done this brilliant campaign um and then i also think um making sure that the teams are working together sounds really simple but in like power of one teams because we've all got different pieces of data um so they would be you might have your ingestion coming from a retailer of like what's my scorecard but you will also have a kind of maybe a scraping system that we have um which helps us look at our perfect store um, so you can see what's out of stock, but you can also see what like your share of voices and why it's changing all the time and ratings and reviews, how they're fluctuating. So there's so much, as you know, um, so much data out there and just putting it all together. If you can, awesome, put it in a tool. You can't always, you don't always get those opportunities and you don't have the teams to help you do that. So at least if you can get everyone together to look at that end to end and build a process, super helpful. This episode of the Shiny New Object podcast is brought to you in partnership with Madfest. Whether it's live in London or streamed online to the global marketing community, you can always expect a distinctive and daring blend of fast-paced content, startup innovation pitches, and unconventional entertainment from Madfest events. You'll find me causing trouble on stage, recording live versions of this podcast, and sharing a beer with the nicest and most influential people in marketing. Check it out at www.madfestlondon.com. 
So what was your kind of first aha moment when it came to data and creativity in advertising that made you realize that there was this st- such a strong relationship between foundation and transformation? Like what was that moment? For I'm going to go back to my business actually, um, was I really wanted, I was 28 and I really wanted the consumer to be cool. Um, and I wanted her to be young and I was forever doing things like flat lays. If you remember those for Instagram, um, and, and I was doing certain types of advertising, um, as well. And, and, and then when I got the data and I could see like, oh gosh, the consumer's not who I think it is at all. And I'll say this again, I was 28 and the consumer was like over 40 living in the suburbs and had high disposable income. And I remember being devastated about that. Now I look back and I'm like, crikey, this is me now potentially. Um, and uh, I was able to like understand what the hell was going on and thank goodness pivot what the hell I was doing, kind of swallow my ego and change what I was doing stock wise change how I was advertising, even started doing some pop-up shops, um, tried to get the consumer to come back in a kind of CRM model with me. Um, it, that to me was really career defining, life defining actually. And that's why I get so obsessed with my teams now about data. And why was it upsetting to you that the audience wasn't who you thought it was? Because no one wants to be wrong. And I was young and had a massive ego and it was my baby, I think. And I just really thought I'd done enough research. Um and as it transpired, you know, I did some really great focus groups and the consumer was just saying to me, you make me look great. I don't have anywhere to shop. You you understand me. Thank you. And I'd like to buy more from you. Um, I probably won't share you with my friends. So it's, my CRM is a problem because they didn't want to share me with any of their friends, but they wanted to buy more. So the propensity to be loyal to me themselves was really high. Um, but it was a big learning. Oh, I find it really interesting when I come across like really egotistical brand leads when they're like, my audience is Gen Z and I'm like, it's not. Let me show you some data. It's really not. And you ha- you're going to have to swallow that and look at how you go to market. Yeah. So let's stay with that little anecdote. So you've got your ego driven brand person and you're going to go, I'm going to show you some data. What is that mm-hmm. data? Yeah, it can be any, I guess, depending on the platform you're looking at as well. Um, so thinking about it's a hell of a lot easier when you've got your own kind of first party data and you're running your own D2C. Um, but if you've got the right partnerships to retailers, you can see it from there. Like one of the, I remember sharing with a brand lead um, in the US when I was working there and Amazon had given me the most incredible profiling of who was buying and I was able to share it from retailer data as well. So who do you think doing this well? Um, and it sounds like, well, I know you've got a very successful team doing this from having, having worked on, on Mars Pet. But who do, you look, who do you look up to outside of your own business and think, do you know what? They've really got it right. And I wish I was more like them. Mm, um, I think Victoria Beckham Beauty's nailing it um, really, really well. Uh, she's doing a great job. I think... A really lovely independent in the UK who I still go back to quite a lot and look at their website and look at how they speak to me and understand me. Um, a company called Patch Plants. Have you heard of them? I think so. I'm going to have a quick look now, remind myself. Go on. It's awesome how they really start to understand you as a consumer and bring the plants to life, ironically, hey. with names and um, how you, how it works for you and how do, how do you want it delivered and they check in with you. Um, I mean, I could go down the whole Dyson route with you, but I'm not going to. I think these brilliant, like agile, small companies like that. Um, and I've come back from living in New York and I was like, I wonder how patch plants are doing here. And I ordered one. And I was like, yes, even better in the four years I've been away. And so what's Victoria Beckham doing? How does How is she combining in foundation and transformation in, in your eye? I think she does um, exceptional user user journey work on her website. Um, she herself is a great marketeer and she links everything. Um, her end service is incredible of like the speed she delivers, how she delivers and the end product and the, the kind of follow-up you get with it as well. Um, 
And then the way she kind of talks to me about um, her, her transformational piece for her would be her innovation and why I need it in my makeup bag. I think the best thing that, that I've seen her do was she did the T-shirt that said, my dad had a Rolls Royce. Was yeah, that like that? yeah. <laughs> it was just so good. The, the absolute best bit from that amazing documentary for anyone who hasn't seen it. The, Everyone's the, the riffed on that, haven't they? That yeah, like chat between them both. Yeah, really yeah, good. yeah. Brilliant. Um, yeah, just having a look at Patch now. It's, it's nice. Um, it's quite interesting. The, the the photos are very unsensationalized. It's like sort of almost poorly lit, very real, kind of very much just at a kind of, sort of ever, ever, almost like dead on. But anyway, so I'm not going to do No, and, I, and I'd love to like go in. No, but it's brilliant. <laughs> it's, it's authentic. And I think I'd love to go in because I would be probably, my profile in the CRM profile would be, you know, one of the people that kills plants. So I'm always, this will last long. You don't have to water it too much. So when's the right time to ditch the data and just get creative? Mm, good question. Um, I think ongoing. I think you always need a bit of data, but I think you can take like really nice pauses and be like, what is it sharing? What is it showing? And like, let's test this. Um, Honestly, there was a moment for me in the middle of COVID where we were working so fast and we were all working on um, teams, I remember. And we were just, the teams were like coming up with ideas continually of like, have you seen this? Yeah, we've gained market share here. Do you think it's this? No, I don't. Do you think it's this? And I would like quite often just be provocative and jump in with a thought. And then they would um, just carry on spinning on it and just like, actually, I think the setting spray, oh my God, I've just looked at this. It's not a setting spray, talking makeup here, um, to um, set makeup. People are using it for, they're hot and they're bothered and they're using it to cool down. And I was like, right, let's pivot some of our copy here. And yeah, I think I think it's ongoing, Tom. So, so talking about getting those brilliant basic, brilliant boring basics right and doing the, the transformation, exciting, cool, testing creative stuff like how do you hire for that how do you build a team that can deliver that do you have like some kind of smooshy unicorns in the middle or do you do right you lot of the data lot you lot of the creative lot how, how do you how do you build the right team to support that ambition yeah i think you're gonna get like a mindset that wants to do data and then you're gonna get a really like really great creative people that will want to do more of the transformational piece or more of the creative stuff and I think you're right. You have to, but you you have to allow those people to like cross pollinate as well, and kind of be able to help their peer set um, work on it, and kind of add their add their points into it. Like I remember having a wonderful creative lady in the team, and she she was the person that always I thought would always come up with all the ideas, and she was she was always live in the chats. But then she would often be like go and sit, and fi I'd find her sat with the data team and be like, I want to do this because I want to make sure what I'm saying is right. And I was like, one day, would you like to go and work over there? And she was like, yes, I would. So I think it's just keeping everybody curious. And if they're working together really well, you can, you can kind of blend teams really well as well. So how do you, how do you get across the, the, the horrible gulf between you've got platform ones and zeros data, which like some people call it silent data. Some call it the shadows of people. That is, there's, ton, there's loads of it. There's, there's more of it you could ever want. And then you've got you 20 people in a focus group and one person leads the conversation and it's all a bit like, oh God, I know you're saying this, but like, would you actually do it? And so you've got, you've got all the warm, gooey, humanness, the observational, qual, soft stuff. And then you've got this like deluge of stuff that the, the platforms are going to spray at you. And one's great for one thing, not great for another. And same with the other one so but there's a gulf there there's still there isn't like a cut and dried way of making that work but for you for mars pet how do you cross that divide we are starting to use ai to do that it's one of the things we've picked up of like we've got to find a way to pull this together um we have one of the things about mars is we have incredible um da teams like really incredible um so they're always looking at how do we bridge gaps like that but I think it takes leadership to say, like, I'm, I'm really clear and I love talking, I was going to say the boys, boys and girls, um, and just be like, this is where I want to go with it. And this is kind of some of the use cases I want to pull out of it. I think you need to give people a steer as well so they can understand how to put those two <laughs> really different um, data sets together. Yeah. But we haven't sold it. No. And I'm... Um 
very confident no one no no one has and uh, and i'm not maybe not sure they ever will and i, I think i think everyone is like nudging forward ai go, can ai go in the middle there solve it so we would you know if they if ai does figure it out then we'll be out of a job in five years anyway so we'll, hopefully it'll not do that immediately uh christina thank you so much man i would love to ask you tons more questions it's been really insightful and enjoyable if someone wants to get in touch with you about any of the things we've talked today where is the best place to do it and what makes a message that you will actually respond to um you can get in contact with me in linkedin message that's fine um spell my name right i think would be one <laughs> and then two um pull out something we've talked about and how you might solve one of my problems nice brilliant well look let's leave it there thank you so much thank you hi just before you go i'd really appreciate it if you could take the time to write a review of the shiny new object podcast on apple podcasts or itunes or whatever it's called these days or whichever podcast provider you use we're an indie podcast so it would go a long way for us if you could just share the word and give us a bit of a support on those channels that would just be fantastic if you haven't got time that's also cool and yeah if you could tell your colleagues about the podcast and also if possible don't forget to subscribe and I'd love to hear your feedback uh, if you'd like to speak on the podcast or be a guest or you think I'm asking the wrong questions anything I'd be super interested to hear what you think so please email me at tom at automatedcreative.net that's t-o-m at uh, I'm not going to bother spelling it anyway you'll work it out thanks so much